Thank you very much, Nicole, and uh, welcome, everybody. I haven't been at any of these uh, presentations. This is my first one. Thanks for um, taking the time out in a very busy season, uh, and I'm really happy to have the chance to talk to you. I, uh, I put all those things in my bio just so that you know I have some training and some background, come from diverse experience, so it's not just here at the Royal, but this is a perspective that's uh, a little bit um, broader. Um, this is my, my first time having a chance to talk to a general audience. I've had a lot of chances to teach medical students, to talk to <laughs> residents, sometimes to nursing staff and surgical suites who aren't really familiar with ECT, but it's my first ha time having a chance to talk to the general public, so I think that's really exciting. Um, before I get into the meat of my talk, I wanted to say that some of the great things we're doing here at the Royal is because we have a great team. And Greg McLeod is here. He's our manager. David Hessens, our project manager from administration. Some of our nurses here are here. You'll hear from them, Dominica and Tanya. And we're honored to have some patients here to share their experiences. So um, with all that, uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a, a background about ECT, what is it, what can it do, some side effects, and just a general framework. Um, after that, our nurses are going to take you through what it's like to get ECT um, on a more uh, frontline kind of perspective. And then we have two patients who are very courageously willing to talk about their stories. And I want to say, I will say it again, but I'll say it now, that um, it's not e always easy to talk about mental illness and especially about ECT, so I'm really honored that you have taken the time to be here and share this with us. Um, this is our suggestion box in our ECT suite, and the reason I put this up is a fewfold. I wanted to first uh, tell you that I don't have any disclosures to make. I'm not affiliated with any company, manufacturer of ECT machines, and I don't get any grants from anybody like that. Um, number two, uh, the way the suggestion box got into our ECT suite is through a quality improvement project uh, called Lean. And David, who's here in the audience, um, uh, organized and orchestrated that project. And the reason the Lean project was so meaningful to me is that part of it involved um, really engaging with patients in a very meaningful way to have them come, not just fill out a survey and say what do you like, what you don't like, but come to a meeting and work through the process with us and share with us their experiences, what they liked, what they didn't like. And part of what uh, flowed out of that was this suggestion box. Um, and I think what it reflects something for me that maybe people are not aware of in ECT is that it's often perceived as something that psychiatrists do to people who are unwilling participants. And I wanted to share with you that it's not the case. Um, consent, collaboration is all part of the ECT process. We do sometimes do ECT on people who have not signed a consent and the reason is if they have a mental illness where they're not able to make that decision, then we go through all the usual informed consent processes with their substitute decision makers. So the suggestion box to me embodies um, the fact that ECT is much more collaborative than you might think. I put this picture up here to remind me of uh, some of the patients that I've treated. And um, the way I got into ECT in the first place, I did my residency at McGill, and I did the usual ECT training. But over the course of my residency, I noticed that people weren't always getting treated according to our treatment algorithms. So to people with depression, oftentimes they would stall and stay depressed and not get better, um, and we wouldn't get to the more complicated treatments on our treatment algorithms. Or people would be in psychotherapy but only get one type and not get multiple types. And so it sort of became uh, my orienting principle to make sure that people had access to treatments that work. And ECT is one of our treatments in psychiatry that really works well. And so I feel strongly that patients deserve to have access to this treatment. And that's how I got into it in the first place. And when I ended up in North Bay, um, they needed a director of the service. And I thought it was important to keep it going. So that's how my career in ECT got started. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about a composite patient. So this is not a real patient, but a, a composite of some um, different patients that I've had, a 67-year-old man um, who has a four-month history of depression, started after some losses, lost his best friend, lost his daughter to cancer. Um, he starts staying home, not going out to Tim Hortons with his friends like he usually does. Um, his daughter, his other daughter, brings him some food. He doesn't really touch it much. He's losing weight. He's very anxious. He can't sleep well. He gets up early in the morning, very anxious, and can't sleep. Um, he starts thinking about what a bad person he is, how he's a burden to everybody, and eventually his depression gets so severe 
severe that he starts believing things like that he's caused problems, that he's created, uh, he made an error in his business and created financial catastrophe for, pe for people. Finally, he starts thinking about suicide um, and he tries to hang himself in his apartment, but luckily he's, re he's rescued before he attempts it by his daughter and comes to hospital. So that's the kind of patient that we're often talking about with ECT. It's not the only kind of patient, um, but I think it's important to know that although ECT may seem like a severe treatment, the disorders that we're trying to treat are also very dis severe. If you have a, a patient and a family member who suffers from a depression like this, it's extremely distressing, and um, both for the patient and for the people around that person, and it can really uh, tear a person's life apart and tear families apart. So um, we're treating very serious disorders here, and sometimes a serious treatment is warranted. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about what is ECT. So. ECT stands for electroconvulsive therapy, and those are the um, uh, those are the <coughs> initials. So, essentially, what it is, not to pull any punches about it, what it is is we run a small electrical current through a person's head where their brain is, and what that does is it gets the nerve cells going, it gets them all firing, it stimulates them to fire together, and when they all fire together, that's a seizure. So we use electricity to produce a seizure. Um, and the ECT device allows us to produce um, the conditions to run a small current through the patient's brain. Um, most of the electricity is dispersed into the skull and into the scalp. So only a small amount actually reaches the brain. And in modern ECT, we do our best to keep the minimum amount of electricity going into the brain, just enough to stimulate those nerve cells to start working together and producing a seizure. Um, so I've shown here um, the two electrodes on either side of the patient's head. Um, one innovation in ECT, um, this is a picture of right unilateral ECT. So the ECT, the electrodes are placed only on one side of the patient's head. Um, one of the things we know about ECT is um, we have to produce a seizure, otherwise it doesn't work. And we have to also um, run the current through specific pathways in the brain. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. We know that from experiments um, on where we put the electrodes. Um, so a more modern form of ECT is right unilateral ECT. And the advantage of this is that it causes relatively less memory trouble than bilateral ECT. Um, and memory trouble, as you probably know, is one of the, the big problems that associated with ECT and one of the main reasons why we don't use it more. Um, so right unilateral is a word that you'll hear if you're looking into modern ECT. Um, when we produce a seizure, this is what we see on ECT monitor, or, or the EEG monitor rather. You'll see in the previous picture, um, those black things are the stimulus electrodes, but if you look on the patient's forehead, you can see EEG electrodes. So um, we don't just monitor the person's seizure by what we see in their body, we monitor it on EEG. And in fact, the person's body has a the person is anesthetized and their muscles are relaxed, so we hardly see any movement in the body. Um, so we need this EEG reading to help us tell, is the person having a seizure? So that's what we see, and this is a result of all the nerve cells working together, the nerve cells in the brain working together in a synchronized fashion. Um, this slide is an illustration of electrical waveforms. So the, on the top, is a sine wave. That's the form of electricity that comes out of the wall. If we were to take electricity out of one of those outlets and put it onto an oscilloscope, we would see that top picture. Um, and in ECT, we use our device to modify the waveform to produce tiny pulses that have a square shape. And the reason is, as that sine wave is, is rolling up, our nerve cells have a chance to adapt and we need more energy. So in a spirit of reducing the energy as much as possible, we use this little square wave. And to, one thing you'll hear about if you look about into modern ECT is um, you'll see ultra brief pulse. So we can vary the width of those pulses and if we get them quite narrow, they start to approximate the normal firing of a nerve cell. And so narrow pulses are associated with less memory impairment. So e although ECT fundamentally is similar to how it was when it got started back in the 30s, there have been a lot of these innovations, uh, the right unilateral placement and ultra brief ECT, um, which mean that some of the most notorious side effects of memory disturbance have been much reduced. 
Um, this is a picture of uh, how the electrical um, energy is dispersed in the brain. Uh, on the bottom, you'll see uh, electrical fields in bifrontal ECT, that's an alternate placement. And in um, the middle, you'll see the electrical fields in bilateral or bitemporal ECT. And this is just to say that um, although ECT may seem crude, it's not a completely um, non-specific treatment. We pay careful attention to where we put the electrodes and to the paths of current in the brain to produce the best therapeutic effect. Um, so after this, you could, I guess you could ask yourself, why on earth would we do such a thing to run electrical current through a person's brain and produce a seizure? And I'll take you through a little bit of the history so that you can understand where we're coming from. Um, Back at the turn of the century in psychiatry, there weren't very many treatments. In fact, if you had a mental illness, you would mostly go to a psychiatric hospital where you would either get better or you would stay there forever. And there were big psychiatric hospitals where thousands of patients lived out their lives. Um, we didn't really have that many effective treatments. In the 20s, people started to uh, develop a hypothesis, which actually was a mistake. It was based on an, an erroneous reasoning um, that p patients with epilepsy didn't have as much mental illness. That turned out to not be true, but it got people interested in wondering if we produced a seizure, could that help mental illness? And so people started using different ways to produce seizure. They did it with insulin. If you've ever seen the movie A Beautiful Mind, that he had uh, insulin coma therapy where they gave him an injection of insulin to lower his blood sugar and produce a seizure. There was also, um, people were injecting chemicals into people's bloodstream that could produce a seizure, initially camphor and then metrazole. Um, but the insulin coma was very dangerous. If your blood sugar goes down, it can really damage the brain. And the metrazole was very unpleasant for patients. When they got that injection, they would have a terrible feeling of dread before they had a seizure, and they really did not like it. Um, so in 1937, uh, two Italians, uh, Cerletti and Bini, came up with electricity as a way of producing seizures. And over time, as their method um, began to be used, we realized that was the safest and most pleasant way to have a seizure induced. Those other ways were either dangerous or very unpleasant for patients. Um, the other thing about ECT is, although it's, it sounds frightening to run a current through the brain, our tissues are actually made of salt and water. And they can conduct electricity. And in fact, that's how they work. And so it's not as frightening as you may imagine. Um, this is the original electroshock apparatus used by Cerletti and Beanie, and later on you'll see a picture of ours, which is more modern. Um, this may be the kind of image that you would associate with ECT from the media. This is an image from London Psychiatric Hospital, um, where in 1943 they moved from using metrazole uh, and inducing seizures that way to, um, uh, to doing ECT instead. Um, you'll see in this uh, image that the nurses are holding the patient down. And um, in the early days of ECT, we didn't use anesthesia. Um, the electricity was enough to make the person instantly unconscious, and so they didn't experience the stimulus. But what happened was when the, the nerve cells all moved or worked at the same time, causes the body to move. And if you're a, a big muscular person, the strength and the force of those muscle movements could be enough to break a bone. And so in the 50s, people got the idea, what if we were to use anesthetic and really relax the muscles so that complication would go away? So now all ECT is done under anesthetic and with muscle relaxation. So you won't see people being strapped down or held down to a bed the way you might see in the movies. Um, so one of the things about ECT and a common criticism is we don't really know how it works. And I want to tell you a little bit about how we think it works because the brain is a complicated organ and we don't really know how our medications work either. Um, so we do know quite a bit about how ECT works, although we may not know the specific holy grail of which is the most effective of these mechanisms. But I'll tell you a little bit about what we do know. Um, so one of the theories of how ECT works involves neurotransmitters. This is a picture of a synapse. That's how nerve cells are connected to each other. And in that gap between the two nerve cells, there are chemicals released, neurotransmitters. So when we do ECT, we know that many neurotransmitters are released. Um, and 
that in turn causes upregulation and downregulation of certain receptors, same as antidepressants do. So if you're familiar with drugs like um, fluoxetine or Prozac that are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or tricyclic antidepressants which affect norepinephrine and dopamine, um, those are all drugs that affect neurotransmitters. So in some sense, ECT may work similar to how antidepressants work through neurotransmitters and uh, receptors. Um, however, recent research is looking at um, regulation of cerebral activity and blood flow. So this is a study of the, the red hot areas are the areas where there was more blood flow after ECT. And those are some areas, um, especially in central brain structures, that are thought to be implicated in depression. So ECT may change um, the distribution of functional um, activation in the brain and the balance between activation in different uh, cerebral areas. Um, this is a picture of, um, this is actually a picture of a mouse nerve cell. And although there are a lot of things on the slide, the one thing I want you to look at, I'll point it out. So if you look at this picture right here. So essentially, um, this was a study that was done on mice um, because we know that ECT produces nerve growth. And it seems a little bit paradoxical because when we think about running electricity through the brain, we think about the possibility of a burn or brain damage. But in fact, what ECT does by inducing this seizure, it stimulates all kinds of mecha mechanisms that that allow nerve cells to sprout and grow. So this was a study they did on mice trying to figure out, well, what are the chemicals, what are the processes that allow the nerve cells to grow? And so this here shows a mouse nerve cell after ECT. So here it is before ECT, and you can see there's not many branches on it. And here after ECT, you can see how it's sprouting and branching. And these over here are nerve cells pre and post that didn't have the specific chemical. So that part is not so interesting for our purposes. But you can see here that there is nerve cell growth after ECT. And I think that's one of the things um, that can be helpful in thinking about ECT and talking to patients about it, that it's not a form of causing brain damage like some uh, anti-ECT advocates um, would have us believe. In fact, it stimulates nerve growth and possibly some of these connections between nerve cells that are extra or new may be responsible for some of the memory disturbance. ECT can cause growth of nerve cells, and I think that's an important thing uh, to know about it. And it may be one of the things that's critically responsible for its additional efficacy over antidepressants. Um, this is another uh, image showing cerebral uh, functional connectivity. So in this study, they were looking at depressed patients. When they're shown a difficult, disturbing image and they're depressed, they get extra activation in their frontal area. So we know that patients who are depressed are more sensitive to negativity in that way. And um, if you look at these images right here, you can see in these frontal areas, when the patients who suffered from depression were shown disturbing images, they had a lot of activation in their frontal areas. And after ECT, the activation in those frontal areas with the disturbing images was less. And this is a more normal pattern of uh, functional connectivity in the brain. So we think it's not only transmitters and not only nerve growth, but a kind of a rebalancing or equalizing of uh, function in different brain areas. So the way ECT has been used um, between the 30s and the 50s, it was used a lot because we didn't have very many other treatments. In the 50s, that's when some of our first psychiatric medications came into use. And then there became a kind of a tension between the drug industry and also the enthusiasm of people who thought, we won't need ECT anymore, we'll just be able to do everything with medications. Um, so there was that tension between pharmacotherapy and ECT. Um, and the other thing is that there was possibly some overuse of ECT. And you'll, if you've ever seen um, the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which everyone who's interested in ECT is usually seen. Um, in that movie, the ECT is used kind of as a punishment for a person who is just irrepressible and challenges authority. And that is kind of the dark side of ECT, using it as a method of behavioral control. So because of those two factors, ECT really fell into sharp decline. And in fact, it kind of died out in a lot of areas. It was preserved in a few academic centers. And paradoxically, in the United States, where there are more disparities of treatment based on economics, um, 
if you're, if you're in a state hospital or if you're from a, a disadvantaged minority population, you often don't have access to ECT. It's people who have money, insurance, and are near an academic center who can get ECT these days. So ironically, it's become much less accessible. Um, since the 1980s, the decline is stabilizing, and there is a, a modest <coughs> increase in some jurisdictions, not all. Um, and that is partly influenced by the fact that ECT is now modified and it's different the way than it was back in the 30s. Um, partly because we've started to realize not everybody responds to medications and medications are good, but not everyone can take them, not everyone responds to them. Um, and finally, the one big advantage ECT has in addition to efficacy is it works faster. So when we have a need for someone to get better quickly, ECT is by far the fastest treatment that we have. Antidepressant drugs may take six or eight weeks to get to their full effect, whereas ECT, we can often see effects within a week, and by four weeks, people are usually better. Um, so this is how ECT used to be done back in the 60s, and um, this is, these are some of the kind of negative images that um, uh, people see where ECT is depicted as a form of torture. The thing about this is, we relaxed the muscles. Jack Nicholson didn't have the muscle relaxant because he had ECT in the pre-modified days. But these days, we do relax the muscles. But when electricity goes into the, um, the muscles of the, the face, we can't stop them from contracting. And so they do produce this facial expression that looks like a grimace. But the person is not suffering in any way. And it is not, it's not torture. It really is just an involuntary muscle contraction. But it is one of the factors that makes ECT look like it's torturous and suffering. Um, so because of all this controversy, there's always controversy. Um, and ECT is one of the most scrutinized treatments in um, modern medicine. Um, this was a, the cover uh, illustration of um, uh, an article in the Toronto Star which reported a dramatic increase in the use of ECT, which really was more an artifact of reporting methods. There hasn't really been much increase. It's a modest increase rather than a startling, startling increase. Um, the other thing is uh, on this thing is Bill 67. So uh, as recently as 2010, um, an NDP member put forth a bill in the Ontario legislature saying, Ontario should not be funding ECT, um, and it actually got read in the House. Um, so there's still a cer quite a lot of negativity about ECT, um, and that's probably based, in, to some extent, on the impact of people's experiences with memory disturbance, um, and we'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit later. Um, so this is a picture of modern ECT on a mannequin, um, and in the picture is Dr. Ribeiro. Um, here in Ottawa, um, Dr. Ribeiro and some of us have developed um, a simulation-based ECT training um, where we teach people modern, safe methods to do ECT. Um, so the modern ECT suite doesn't really look anything like the Jack Nicholson uh, scenario. Um, this is just to illustrate the point that I made earlier that ECT use um, is in fact declining. This is a, um, looks from 1993 to around 2009, and you can see that the use of ECT in general hospitals in the United States is, va is declining quite a lot um, in every age group. Um, and this is always a source of alarm for me, just in the sense that I think um, it's really important if you need ECT to be able to have access to it, and if fewer and fewer centers are doing it, um, it might negatively inf impact your ability to get it if you really need it. Um, so worldwide, um, ECT is a bit different. In North America, in Europe, in the United States, ECT is primarily a treatment for depression. Um, in other countries, such as um, China, India, ECT is used first line for schizophrenia. Um, so it has very different uses uh, uh, around the world. There is some general increase in uh, outpatient or ambulatory ECT um, around the world. And here in North America, there's been some recent data looking at how ECT can be helpful in treatment-resistant schizophrenia. So in a place like the Royal, where we specialize in treating things that are treatment-resistant, ECT really has an important role. Um, this was an editorial from CMAJ, and um, the reason I 
I pulled this out, it comes from 2014, which basically said we need to do better with depression because we do have lots of treatments for depression. There's um, exercise and psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, there's different effective medications, augmenting strategies, different forms of neurostimulation, including ECT. But patients don't always have a systematic way of getting access to all these treatments. Um, and we need to be more systematic and use the various things that we have because depression is a profoundly disabling illness that causes uh, more suffering and disability than many big illnesses like heart disease. Um, so um, I put this up just to say that ECT is part of this better and systematic treatment. It's not the only thing, but it is part of it, and it needs to be available in a community. Um, these are just some, um, some studies about the efficacy of ECT. Some critics of ECT will say that it doesn't have demonstrated efficacy. And the points that I want to make from this slide are that it does have demonstrated efficacy in randomized control trials, number one. It does have one kind of Achilles heel, which is it works great, but once you get the person better, there's a very high relapse rate. And so ECT alone is not enough to keep somebody better. Afterwards, we still need pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy, and a concerted effort to keep the person well. And sometimes that may involve ECT given over time. Um, so that's another criticism of ECT that you sometimes see is, well, it works, but then it doesn't keep the person well. And for sure, that's something that we know about. Um, but with appropriate pharmacotherapy and um, maintenance ECT, we can often reduce that relapse rate to something that's acceptable, especially in this often treatment-resistant population. Um, so. ECT is good for some things and not for others. Um, so we know it's definitely not good to be used for cases like Jack Nicholson of a person who just wants to challenge authority. Um, it's great for major depression. It works well for mania. It's good in schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder if there's treatment resistance. There are some medical conditions like Parkinson's for which it can be helpful as well. It doesn't work well for chronic, persistent, low-grade depression. It doesn't work well for anxiety problems, substance use, eating disorders, personality disorders. But if people do have these problems and depression, it could still work well for the depression. So sometimes it can be useful as part of an overall uh, program for people with these diagnoses if they have some depression ongoing. Um, it has a great remission rate. So um, in major depression, its remission rate is 80 to 90 percent. So that means if 10 people with major depression get ECT, eight or nine of them will get to remission, which means back to normal. Um, if you take medications, the remission rate, rates are about 60 to 70 percent. So it's more effective. And one of the interesting things about ECT is the more severe your depression, the better the ECT works. So that's a little bit unusual in medical uh, conditions. Um, if you have a chronic depression treatment resistance, um, then ECT may help you but may not get you to remission. And so it's important for patients to be aware of that. Um, and we talked about how relapse rates are high. So ECT can't be the only thing in your armamentarium if you want to help someone with depression. Um, it's great when we need people to respond quickly, like if they're not eating and drinking or if they're very suicidal. Sometimes it's paradoxical, but sometimes our medications are more risky than ECT because ECT is very brief, whereas medications, you have them in your system all the time. Sometimes for a person with a lot of medical problems, ECT is actually easier on the body than medications. Or if a person just wants it or they had a good response in the past. Um, so those are some of the reasons why we might use ECT. And as a second line, if people have tried a whole bunch of stuff for depression and it's not working well or they can't take them, ECT can be an alternative. Um, I, I mentioned elderly people just because um, at the Royal we have a very big geriatric population and there is some evidence to suggest that ECT may be more effective in older patients than in younger patients. Um, and it is, it is being investigated right now in terms of using it in the context of dementia. That's still an, an investigational um, area. Um, it does have more complications in older people, but it's still safer than medications overall. 
Um, so I'm going to get to side effects because that's one of the, the reasons why people are against ECT. Um, one of the biggest things that people complain about is memory disturbance. Um, so I'll get to that in one second, but I'll deal with the issue of severe uh, side effects and even death. It's very rare to die in ECT, but it can happen. Just as if you take a medication, you can get anaphylaxis or a severe allergic reaction and die. So it's not very common, but it can happen. So that's one of the reasons why this is a second line invasive treatment. Um, <laughs> The risk is about 1 in 10,000, which is about the same risk as a normal, healthy woman having a baby. So it would be very rare to have a serious adverse effect and die in ECT, but it could happen. Um, so that's one thing people need to be aware of. It's a serious decision to go ahead with ECT. Um, the other thing is the memory disturbance. So very often it's limited to the time that you're getting the treatment, but people do report losing memories that happened before the ECT. So, um, for example, if I started getting ECT today, um, it's possible that I might forget something that happened to me in the month of November. For most patients, it's both worth it and it's also not the big important things. Um, but there are a substantial minority of patients who report losing memories of things that were important to them, a trip that they took or something that was very meaningful to them. So that is a big side effect of ECT. Um, and I think it's important for psychiatrists to be really upfront about the memory disturbance. It is a great treatment, but there is this risk of having memory trouble, which we really need to take into account. Um, so. I want to spend a bit more time on memory just because it's such um, a big issue in ECT. It's pretty common. Um, there's a characteristic pattern of the ECT-induced memory disturbance. Um, you may be left with some gaps in your memory, like I just described. Um, the difficulty forming new memories is usually temporary and limited to the period while you're getting the ECT. And after a month after ECT, you should be back to normal in terms of remembering things that happen to you as they go along. Um, paradoxically, if you have a severe depression, you may have very poor concentration. You may not be able to remember things anyway. So many patients report that their memory actually improves with ECT. And there's also quite a lot of variability from patient to patient. We do also have ways to minimize the memory trouble, like putting the electrodes on the right side or um, using the ultra brief pulse width. So um, the story with memory disturbance and ECT is a complicated one. Um, so in summary, uh, ECT is the best treatment we have for depression. It works quickly. It's a safe treatment. And it's not only a last resort. If I want you to remember something about ECT, it's this. Um, and I also want to touch on where does ECT fit in. Um, this is a slide that illustrates different neurostimulation treatments. So ECT is one of the oldest neurostimulation treatments and it's one of the most effective. But there are newer ones that are up and coming. Um, so this slide illustrates uh, TMS. So here is a transcranial magnetic stimulation coil. Um, so we're looking for ways to stimulate the brain without producing a seizure. So this is an up and coming treatment, but it doesn't have the same efficacy. The remission rates are somewhere like 20 to 30% instead of the 80 to 90%. Um, but it does, it can produce some improvement even if you don't get to remission. So that's an important thing to think about. And over here, this illustrates the concept of deep brain stimulation, where an electrode is put into certain areas of the brain and that are stimulated directly. Um, and that is under investigation at this time. So right now, ECT is a standard treatment for treatment-resistant depression. TMS is getting there, but not widely available. Um, and deep brain stimulation remains investigational. But in the next five to 10 years, these treatments should take their place and develop um, as we know more about how they work. So that's a bit of an overview of what ECT is. And now I'm going to turn the floor over to um, our uh, passionate and dedicated ECT nurses who will take you through um, what it's like to get a treatment. Hello, everyone. My name is Domenica. I've been an ECT nurse for 17 years. So I first started there not knowing anything about ECT and became to love working in that environment. And I'll go into more details uh, after Tanya does her presentation. 
so my name is Tanya and I've been a nurse in ECT for seven years now. Uh, I became involved um, in ECT because I was a nurse here, I was casual, and a position came up and um, I started working there. I wasn't really sold on ECT because when I was a nursing student, I saw one treatment being done and I didn't quite understand it and um, that was my idea of the procedure. Um, but after working here at the Royal for, it was probably just about a month, um, I realized how wonderful it was just to see the people um, get better so quickly, like you could see them improve daily. Um, so I'm now very passionate about it, I'm a real advocate for ECT. and. Um, I'm going to briefly take you um, to a walk through ECT when, that, when a person would come to our suite. Um, so some people have ECT three times a week, uh, once a week, and maybe sometimes once a month. It depends on what the doctor and um, they would decide. Um, and people are treated um, in the hospital here as well as in the community. So a lot of people come as an outpatient and we treat people 16 years old and up. Um, and it's not just very ill people, like I said, it's people living at home with families and having jobs and living in the community. Um, so a person would come, they would arrive in, to our uh, new waiting room. And uh, we just finished doing renovations and uh, most of our renovations were done with the help of our, our some of our patients. Um, we did a lot of um, work to try and figure out what they want. And uh, so now we've got a television and it's nice and private and cozy and um, everybody's telling us how wonderful and how great everything is now with our new renovations. So, um, so when it's uh, their turn, we would bring them from the waiting room into the uh, recovery room and uh, we'll get them comfortable in a, in a bed with warm blankets if you like. And then we would start a, a small IV in their hand so that the doctor has access to give them a sleeping medication and an anesthetic. Um, so that they're relaxed and comfortable for the procedure. And again, it's nothing like shown in the movies. It's very um, safe and controlled. And um, again, I'm just so amazed at how well it works and how many people I've seen go from inpatients to back home to school or back home with their families and come and visit us anytime. <laughs> Dominica? So I'm just, I'm going to continue uh, with the procedure um, or the process. Um, so the procedure is, is quite quick and patients are only asleep for a very short amount of time and they're quite surprised when they wake up that it has uh, been complete, uh, that they've had their treatment already. Um, and this is actually the machine um, that's used during the treatment. Um, and then after their treatment, they're taken back into the recovery room. So we're back into the recovery room. And uh, here they are monitored for 30 minutes. We monitor their vital signs, and uh, that could be their blood pressure, the pulse, their oximetry. oximetry. And um, if they're an inpatient, then they go back to the room after the 30 minutes. If they're out from the community, uh, we serve them muffins, uh, yogurt, coffee, tea, juice before they're uh, seen by their doctor and allowed to go back home. And the reason, um, I'll just put it on that. Uh, the reason why I uh, like working in the CT department and I've been there uh, the longest, um, it's a wonderful place to work. The environment is, uh, is nice and uh, it's just very rewarding to see our patients who, ha who have been sick get much better. Um, it's quite amazing to see them improve uh, on a daily basis. Um, and we have depressed patients, suicidal patients, and to see them go home after uh, ECT has been started, they've been sick for a while, and then the ECT has been started, they improve <coughs> tremendously. Um, I always say to, our, to my coworkers, it'd be nice to take a video of them before their treatment and then after their treatment, and just to see the difference in them is amazing. Um, many of our patients also have told us that ECT has changed their lives, and it's so rewarding to hear that. We also have students come through ECT as well, and it's a teaching hospital, so they do visit the ECT department. And after seeing ECT, they realize that it's nothing like the movies, 
and they can't believe how simple a procedure it is. Um, and it's too bad that the movies had pro have portrayed ECT so badly. Um, it would be nice in this time if a movie, if they are going to portray ECT, that they would do it realistically and uh, to show that it's not as bad as it was in the past. So thank you very much um, for taking us through that. Um, when I was preparing this talk, I thought it would be really nice if we could have um, some patients uh, who would be willing to share their stories with us. Um, and I, I have to admit that I asked our patients with a bit of trepidation, thinking, do you really want to do this? And I was just so pleased and excited that we found two patients who really um, wanted to share their stories. So I'm going to invite Beverly now. Um, to share her story with you, and uh, I will give you the floor. Thank you. Um, my name is Beverly Lear. I had depression since I was a teenager. Um, it affected me quite a bit in, in my teens, and then receded until uh, menopause. Then menopause, it came back with vengeance, and I'm very treatment resistant, which means that um, medications don't always work with me. Actually, I haven't found a medication that will bring me out of depression. I'm taking a combination of different uh, medications along with ECT. And I've just finished a, a course of weekly ECTs as an outpatient, which has been very, very helpful. I'm, on the road to recovery, just about there. there I, I'm feeling great right now. And we'll um, space the ECTs uh, as I continue to maintain my health. And hopefully we'll get to maybe one every four or five weeks and that'll be wonderful for me. But I'll share a bit of my experiences with you so you have an idea from the patient. Some will be a little bit of a, um, a repeat, but uh, from a different view. And um, let's see. I've had over 100 ECTs, in, especially in the last 10 years, both as an inpatient and as an outpatient. And I credit ECT with saving my life. At least three times I've been depressed to the point of suicide and have been brought back through ECT, usually by hospital stays and three times a week ECT. And it's worked. It works for me. So I'm completely in favor of ECT and the treatment that uh, you get. And um, Dr. McMurray and the uh, ECT staff make the procedure as painless as possible. I sort of compare it to going to the dentist. I'm a little bit nervous the night before, but I know it's, it's going to help. So um, I'll, I'll go for it. And uh, the day of the ECT, when I get to the ECT suites, I'm met by a nurse who takes my vital statistics. And then I'm brought into the, uh, the suite and put in a stretcher and uh, prepared for, for my treatment, which means mainly no jewelry, no, no dentures, that, that type of thing. I can't think of anything else when right off. But um, then it's usually about a half an hour a week till my turn comes up. And then um, I'm wheeled into the treatment room where I'm connected to machines that register my physical and mental uh, activity in my, for the, the doctors. And as this is going on, the anesthesiologist is preparing medications for the procedure and starts to administer the uh, medications and put me puts me to sleep, so that's all I've 
I know up to that point. But uh, when I wake, I'm in the being monitored and reassured by a nurse um, on a one-to-one -one basis and taken care of, you know, so well that uh, I hardly realize that the procedure has finished. Um, but this continues for about a half an hour while my body vitals settle into the, the normal range. And all the care I receive is exemplary. The doctors, nurse, and the staff giving the best of care. There is a very strong team spirit within the unit. And I must say, the staff must really love their jobs because it comes across in everything that they do. Because I'm an outpatient, I have to stay an extra half hour and for monitoring. But then my daughter-in-law comes and gets me and uh, helps me down to the car. My legs are a little bit wobbly at that point, but uh, other than that, I, I feel fine. And she drives me home. We have a tea and a little bit of conversation. But from that point, I head off for a nap. So for a couple of hours, I have a very nice nap. I wake up and I'm fully refreshed. From that point, um, usually I do my normal activities, you know, preparing dinner and, and that type of thing. And um, I pamper myself that night, curl up with a good book or something like that, but give my body a little bit of rest for the day. <laughs> and, uh, and that's my ECT experience. But, um, I found ECT through the years has been a miracle to me. And uh, I'm just 100% in favor of it and would encourage anyone who's having severe uh, depression and their do if their doctor advises it, uh, don't be afraid. It's not as bad as it may look on the uh, on the, uh, the screen. It's uh, done in such a humane way. Uh, and you're welcome to ask me questions afterwards if you have any. Thank you so much, uh, Beverly, for uh, sharing your story. And uh, I have to say that although my whole life is dealing with patients, um, working with patients as colleagues, both in the Lean Project and sharing the podium with, uh, with my patients, is something that's really um, meaningful for me. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, so now I'm going to turn the floor over to Donna, who's going to share a different perspective. Um, I, I think when you give speeches, it should be long enough people remember that you spoke and short enough to remember what you said. So I'm going to keep mine brief. I wasn't planning on actually giving any personal history, but I've been uh, inspired by Beverly being very open. Um, I'm 38 years old. I've had depression since I was a teenager. Um, and I controlled it through various methods uh, throughout my undergrad and law school whether it would be medication or eating disorders, drug abuse, alcoholism. Um, I was a very successful lawyer on Bay Street in Toronto and after about eight years, all the depression really did catch up with me and I hit rock bottom and returned home to Ottawa uh, to receive treatment. Uh, it took me, and I know Dr. McMurray has, has mentioned, kind of getting maybe an organizational structure that gives people uh, more expedient access to health care, especially um, mental health care. But it took me quite a long time to, to get to the Royal, and I'm very, very thankful uh, that I did. My treatment has been unbelievable. Uh, I was an inpatient here, and I'm now an outpatient here. Um, I've had experience on the mood and anxiety uh, floor. I've also had experience in the substance abuse uh, floor, and of course, ECT. Um, you know, when you first think about ECT, you really are thinking about Dr. Frankenstein and the lab 
And I was saying to Dr. McMurray and, and to Dominica and Tanya before we started that I had watched a video before I'd signed my consent, and it really was a scene out of Mad Men. It was totally 60s style, uh, very much when flew over the cuckoo's nest, so it wasn't really a good start to my informed consent. Um, but I, I, I did decide to do it. And I very much echo what Beverly said. Look, this is a very hard decision to make. Um, but when you do decide to make it and you get uh, to the ECT suite, it is extremely professional. Uh, the staff is very kind and very generous with their time, but also just with themselves. I remember the first time I woke up and Dominica was right there and I said, she said, are you okay? And I said, you know, I have some jaw pain. And she right away got the anesthesiologist and, and they gave me something for my jaw pain. And then thereafter, every ECT treatment that I had, they gave me uh, the medication even before, I guess uh, simultaneously with giving me the other uh, medication to put me to sleep. The one thing that I, I did want to say is the one thing, a very valuable lesson that I've, I've learned from, I guess, being having depression and also from ECT is, is when you're depressed and you're, and you're really in this black hole, you're really trying to grab onto any anchor that you can find, any magic pill, any cure-all that's a, that I'm going to be fixed and tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'm going to feel better. And the one thing that you do, when I heard about ECT, I really did put a lot of eggs in that basket of ECT. And, and, and tomorrow I'm going to feel much better and everything, and I'm going to go back to being a successful lawyer. And I think what you need to realize, or what people who are thinking about ECT need to realize, is that it's a tool in the basket. And it's a very valuable tool, and I'm extremely supportive. But it is one tool, it's a building block, in, in combination with psychotherapy and, and other different types of group therapies, uh, pharmacology, and, and so that was the one thing. That I did feel quite a bit of bump, um, but I did feel regression from ECT um, after I had finished, and, and it was that realization that it is that in combination with all of the other things that the mental health community has to, has to offer. And you, you need to go into ECT realizing that this isn't going to be a cure-all. It is not a magic pill. Uh, it's certainly uh, very effective and it is helpful, but it's a building block. Um, I guess the last thing I just, I, I really very much appreciate the opportunity to come here today and it's not, you know, you, you go see your doctors, you don't have, um, you're not feeling well and you don't really take the time necessarily to tell them how grateful and appreciative you are for their time. Um, you know, I find people here in, in the ROH, they really do go the extra mile uh, to make sure that, that you understand, that they understand that you are in pain and that they're here to help you. And so I just wanted to take a minute to really thank you and thank you so much for, for inviting me to speak. Thanks. Thank you so much, Donna, for sharing your perspective on that. And I really do appreciate um, that you've had the courage, both uh, Donna and Beverly, to share a bit of your experiences. And, you know, I've talked about ECT a lot, and I do like doing ECT for the same reasons that um, Tanya and Dominica have expressed, that it's really rewarding to be able to help your patients. And um, I think, though, that if you are not involved in treating such severe patients, or if, you're, if you don't see the longitudinal effects of the treatment and only see it once, you don't really have that perspective and it may seem like a disturbing treatment. Um, and it's one thing for doctors and nurses to say, oh, ECT is not as bad as you think. But when it comes from someone who's actually been through it, I think it's a lot more meaningful. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, and I think maybe we can just all give them one last round of applause.